Do we not have Octans data anywhere anymore? I mean, I know it exists, the, but... It doesn't go to the sensor page right now. Oh, okay. There's no other place to get it, really? Uh, your compass. Also says oh, well, I heading wanted, right there. No, no, um... I wanted pitch. It's right at the top of the... Right on top of your compass. Oh, awesome. Pitch okay. and roll right there. Top center. Awesome, yep, I see it. That's exactly what I wanted. Do you have any pitch control? No. Yes, in a way. Just ballast or like weight? Or? Ballasting, like accelerating forward and back. Being a doofus and driving too fast makes me like porpoise. So no, I don't really have pitch authority, um, which is sort of a occupational hazard of being pa passively stable. Um, we try and ballast it so we're pitched down just a little bit. Uh -huh. I think we'll look we are about this, three uh, degrees, two to three coral degrees down. Okay. Here. That's because the buoyancy is all at the top. That you yeah. yeah. But we can move the weights around to try and pitch it down a little bit. Uh huh. Heteropathies? Um, let's see here. Go for Zoom. I think this is probably going to be something in the genus Trisopathies. I don't think I've heard you talk about that yet. Trisopathies, yeah. Trisopathies, okay. It's Actually, I probably have. I just can't remember. It, they're sometimes tough to tell apart. Yeah, heteropathies is more planar. Okay. Um, Trisopathies has more um, three-dimensional branching. Right, okay. Uh. Sort of like Douglas fir versus, go what? I don't know, grand fir. Spruce versus grand fir. Sure. Yeah, that's <laughs> a good analogy. <laughs> I'm trying to learn my island trees. I don't, I don't know the other tree that you said. Uh, grand fir? No, I've never heard of it. Uh, Is it a west coast? Yeah, I think so. It's just got... Um, all its needles are in a plane, I think. So okay. trisopathies is all is sort of spiky in all directions, bottle brushy. Yeah. Okay. Haven't spent enough time out on the west coast to really appreciate the tree fauna. Oh, the trees are, so, that is what the West Coast does really well. Flora, sorry, not fauna. I'm usually used to saying fauna. <laughs> um, no, my only exposure was last year during our quarantine um, in Seattle, mm -hmm. which was not much of a quarantine because we couldn't even go outside. Oh, of yeah. The fires. Oh, it must have been in yeah. August. We had one good day of decent air and then smoke it's really hard but you got to look at some trees that day i did look at some trees yeah <laughs> set us up in a really nice place the city of seattle has some great trees in it there's a lot of these trees that i love called monkey puzzle trees like oh, that are yeah. used ornamentally in mm -hmm. seattle yeah those are fun giant weeping sequoias like the bent wizard trees um yeah, I really like the trees that are ornamental in Seattle. I recommend the uh, botanical gardens if you get a ch oh, chance to walk yeah. from the ship in uh, Honolulu. Oh, really? Yeah, it's nice. It's five bucks, and it's uh, you know, a nice COVID-safe outdoor activity. Awesome. In so Seattle, I highly recommend the Arboretum. That is pure magic. That's like my running park, Gabby. Nice. Yes. Like, are you serious? Yeah, it's like 10 minutes from my house. Oh, man, that's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Uh, are you north or south? Are you like in the, do you have to cross the bridge to get there? Um. Yeah, yes, but like one of those really small bridges. So okay. not the big one. Um, technically, I can, yeah.
kind of like bike over the bridge and then oh, run there. Oh, that's magical. So you're yeah. in the U District? Nearby, yeah, in Wallingford. Oh, nice, okay. I used to live very close to the Arboretum in Boston. Oh, oh, oh my nice. gosh, here's There's another snail just bailing out. Where are you going, buddy? He's just going to keep going. Bridge, Nav. Oh, he's stuck. He's trapped. <laughs> he's just like a little pinball. We can keep that move going. 100 meters, zero, 080. Zero. Yeah, I, I think the most striking thing about those is that Thank they you. don't have any idea where they're going. They just they know that it'll be fine when they get there. Yeah. They hope. Maybe. Um, it must. I mean, it's fine enough that they've that they still exist. <laughs> yeah, they they must have a pretty decent depth distribution because you can imagine you build up some mo momentum. You could be drifting for several hundred meters. I think that he is constantly keeping himself going, or she. I think like I think he's kicking out with his foot and constantly keeping himself going. I don't think that fall just like happens. You think they're no. moving all the time? Uh, no. I mean, I just think like when they're falling, like they're they're making it happen the whole time. They're oh yeah, no, it's it's definitely an active process. Yeah. yeah. Here's a cool star. And then they must just like climb back up again, I guess. Do it all again the next day. <laughs> Go for Zoom. Oh, I think I know what this is. Um, so I, I think this is Pythonaster, uh, which is actually, if it is Pythonaster, they're interesting because they're sponge predators. Ooh. Sponge predator. Go in. A glass eater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that seems like a crazy thing to do. It's got a good hiding spot, though. Maybe not. Python Aster seems to have only five arms. I wonder if that one's just an oddball or if it's actually something diagnostic. Could be a solasterid too. No, bathypathies, haven't seen those in a while. I, I think if I had to pick an geologic area to travel back in time to would probably be the Cretaceous. Sounds like a fun time. What are you what what critters are you thinking of when you think of the Cretaceous? I'm just I'm just thinking of like probably the most immaculate types of coral reefs and th things you've ever seen. Um you know, there's a lot of coral reef development during that time period. Temperatures were warmer. Um I mean being able to see dinosaurs wouldn't be that bad. Also, <laughs> that I love this question. Cool. Yeah, yeah, for your favorite. If you had to pick, yeah. I, I wish I knew more about geologic history. I know. Maybe we should all think about it and come back next watch for yeah. the answer. I mean, I'm thinking about like, have you guys ever seen Fantasia? No. There's like oh, a segment. a long time. Yeah, there's like a segment of it where they just, I think it's, I think it's like hosts the planets. They like go through the entire history of Earth. Yeah, that one's really cool. Um. And uh, it looks very cool up until when the dinosaurs die, and then it's really sad. Yeah, you don't want to be around at the end of the Cretaceous. That's a it's a bad time. Oh, so life. that okay? That was the end of the Cretaceous, <laughs> Roger. The Dark Ages. Yeah, there was a there was a pretty nasty extinction event. The and that was the asteroid one, potentially. Uh, I, I think that might have triggered it. Yeah, but there there were also yeah, other. Not a good time to be a critter, Roger. <laughs> Not a good time to be a, a large animal. If you're if you're a mammal, it's probably a good time to be alive for a little bit. And if you're an invert, it's like always a good time to be alive. Oh yeah, yeah. always a good time. <laughs> Have a two meter long proboscis. You're you're good to go. <laughs>
<laughs> can slurp that sediment all day long. <laughs> uh, we just come back there. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Spoonworm. Uh. <laughs> I just had a rock that looked like a face moment. Uh, it just <laughs> makes me laugh. Slightly more alive than rocks that look like rocks. <laughs> <laughs> so we're 570 meters away from the top of this knoll, and I really want to get us there in our watch. Okay, what's it going to take? I think we'll get there. Okay. We're good, at our speed. So we just have to keep doing what we're doing, basically. Don't change anything. Okay, don't ever change. Don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. These nice. things are so beautiful. Bit of Gorgia, Magnus Paralis. The one we saw previously that you had gotten the, the really nice shot down the barrel of the helix, it's pr probably a different species. Oh, the, really? The oh, the, Bella. the yep. tighter spiral or something? Yeah. This is more, see more if characteristic I can get of Magnus Steve Paralis. His, um, good separation between the critter and the background. Do you need me wide? No, this is too this is too cool. Okay, now you can go wide. Yeah. There. That's what he's talking about. I can actually see it now. It's amazing. Zooming. Yeah. So cool. Let's get lasers off for a second, please. Struggling at the bottom to spiral. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. That was cool. Yeah. Practice. It did get sort of wrapped around and started hitting the seafloor. Yep. And it gets really tough. That was just nice because it was tall enough. Yeah. Yeah. I think for like an imaging camera, if you had it separate than a flying camera, it would be cool to be lower on the ROV. It could, it would be cool to what? To be lower on the ROV in a way. Oh, interesting. Because then you're Why not is looking that? Still cameras? You're not looking down at everything. Oh, okay. You know, you're, you're less likely to get ground right behind the subject oh yeah yeah okay interesting we had the we had the when we had the miso camera and housing that was mounted much lower and that was getting great shots mm -hmm. yeah um, if, if you think of wildlife photography um it's almost, it's almost always better when you're at like eye level of the the animal or even lower um so if you're photographing a bird, say a shorebird that's on the beach, and you're standing up, you know the sand is only like four inches behind the bird. Right. But if you're able to get, if you're if you're able to get laying down on your stomach and photograph, you can get just much more sense of the environment. You can look, you know, yep. way off in the distance, bit of right. sky, bit of water. Way more sand in your camera. Oh yeah. It's worth it though. <laughs> I believe it. They have these like 
they have these little blinds for photographing ducks that are basically f floats. So you're like in the water and your I'm good. elbows and the camera are on like a little float in front of you. So you're basically at water level for the oh, photography. Awesome. Yeah. Need to find more boulders. More corals, please. Find the boulders and you'll find the corals. Okay, uh, we actually can do that. That is one of the few things that are easy to find underwater. Yeah, <laughs> should, should be um, pretty they'll, hot There's return. one right ahead, sonar. yeah. Boulders, outcrops, promontories, pinnacles, all of those things. Yeah, if, if you're a coral or a sponge and you've got one settlement. You got do, one chance. You got one chance. <laughs> where do oh, you man. go? If I had one chance, it would not be good. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I have lived a lot of places. <laughs> uh, none of them were terrible, though, I guess. Were any of them terrible? I guess some of them were terrible. At least the weather's a little chilly down here, but it's consistent. Yeah. All year round. That's a big thing. Yeah. Same temperature, same humidity. Well, you don't have to worry about the view. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the view's kind of a bummer. But maybe there's like a chemical view. Oh, I guess there probably is. Maybe a magnetic or electrical view. pressure like sound waves and stuff We have a viewer hearing us use the word invert and asking what that is. And that's a sh shortening invertebrate, um, which are organisms that lack a backbone. So in meaning without and vertebrate, meaning like vertebrae or your backbone, which is most of what these animals are that we're seeing down here. These uh, sea cucumbers, mollusks, all of these are um, lacking a backbone, which is pretty obvious when you're looking at them. And then any vertebrates we would see down here would really just be fish, right? Fish. So yep. far, yeah. Yep. I mean, you could see non-vertebrate chordates down here as well, like the tunicates. That just blows my mind. Like, what? Non-vertebrate chordates? Yeah, that's crazy. And that, like, tunicates are, like, our common ancestor with lot of the stuff we're looking at here right yep yeah yeah i haven't seen any tunicates in a while but they um in their larval stage they have a, a complete uh notochord um, nerve cord in the back of their bodies that they lose and reabsorb when they settle down and uh a hagfish would that be a That'd be a vertebrate or an invertebrate. It'd be invertebrate, right? It, Hagfish. It's a, it's a vertebrate. Okay, but not a not a true fish. The jawless not, fish. Not a true jawless fish, fish yeah, right? Yes. An ancient lineage. Yeah. That is a true fish, though. Hey, it's just not a bony fish, right? 
or is it a? It's not a bony fish. Yeah, it's it's a distant lineage, um, kind of like you know how sharks are. Uh, sharks and bony fishes uh, share more similarities than hagfishes and all the other agnatha group jawless fishes. Lampreys. Lampreys. Ugh. Yeah. Nightmare fishes. So a true fish, but not a bony fish. What is a true fish? <laughs> yeah, we need we need to have more fish specialists out. I feel like it would be really great to have someone. I feel like they'd be a little sad on this Bridge, on this eh? dive. Yeah, no. With fish specialists, with fish people, you know, you really have to dive shallower yeah. there's just not that much here but if you bring Let's keep this fish specialists into the zero thousand meters zero. and shallower mm -hmm. uh, and especially 500 meters and shallower okay thank you, you i appreciate see some it tremendous diversity we're missing out on some of my favorite fish by diving at these depths like the oreos oh yeah i love those the which the oreo fish Oreo fish. I'm not sure yeah. I'm familiar. What are Oreo fish? They're in a group of fishes, a family of fishes called the Oreo somatidae. Okay. And oh, they, this uh, is their actual, like, yeah, it's, it's not the common name. <laughs> yeah. We call them Oreos um, for short, but they are typically found at a thousand meters and shallower. Uh, and they can be found in this area as well. But uh, they're you have yeah, really kind of charismatic fish. They'll come up right up to the camera and look at their reflection <laughs> in the dome. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! And uh, yeah, sometimes they they you can see them in clusters of you know, three or four uh, in a small area. But they're uh, we had one actually, I think it was one ten, come up and start like taking bites like out, <laughs> out of the dome thinking it was because they're really territorial oh like a damselfish or something yeah similar <laughs> the dome's really shiny and weird yeah i imagine some you know animals that when you get up to, to areas where they're more you know likely to respond to visible light um uh, start to do that yeah, maybe maybe it had a really good reflection. It was another Oreo fish in yeah. the dome. Steve, did you hear about the shark that bit the football on the tether on the last cruise? The last cruise? Oh no, I uh, vaguely, yeah, but no details. It was while we were recovering. There was a white tip came and investigated the tether. Hmm. Took a little nibble at the uh, football. Any loss or no? Couldn't no. even find teeth marks. It was uh. like, it was a like delicate like taste test, yeah. and then like full yuck face. <laughs> like it was not pleased. I don't know. Uh, we're moving pretty quickly. We might actually be able to take another rock sample. Ooh. Coming up a bit faster than I thought. Got about 100 meters vertical for the next rock. Yes, more critters. Nice. More Romula gorgia, this Chrysogorgid. Sea fans, unbranched bamboo corals, uh, polyopagon, sponge. Go for zoom. Yeah, that's good. Doesn't have to be the whole leg. I'm gonna seek out this bamboo too. Looks like possibly some fresh tissue loss on that bamboo. This is not colonized by anything else. 
This might oh, have yeah. been recent. It's a curious branch point there. Can we zoom in on the branch point of that bamboo? Sure. It's got really, really dense polyps. It's hard gonna be hard to see. Yeah, it is. Tough to tell. It's almost like they're denser there. Yeah, it, that one could have actually been a wound, not not a like a branch point. Oh, so some sort of wound that you know an animal okay, made was resettled or colonized by something else, like an anemone, and the coral fights back. Lots of rocks. Two squat lobster associates on that Chrysocordia bottle brush. Is there any control you have of Argus Dash? I can, it's just on the tilt, that's all I can Roger. tilt it up and down, yeah. Fish? Are we at uh, 10 meters? I switched them to 50, 50 meters. meters, yeah. Just trying to trick everybody. Make it harder. Great. We do have a lot of lovely rocks here. Maybe we can get a rock sample at our exact depth target. Ooh. That would be delightful. On target? That would be great. Something to shoot for. How are we doing on uh, sample sheets? We have plenty there.
So Steve, earlier you mentioned, or we noted that we kind of have these boulders scattered around similar to our first dive. What do you think is causing that versus kind of the different types of geology we've seen on different slopes that we've explored? Uh, on this slope, I think what we're seeing is one of two things. Um, the larger boulders could just be part of the the bedrock, quote unquote bedrock of the seamount, and it's just these exposures. Some of these, like these rounder ones, actually look like they could have fallen from some place um, and become attached over time. Huh. Um, but yeah, the the other sites uh, we're seeing here a lot more sediment which makes me think that on this side of the seamount, there might be a bit of a, a shadow that you know leads to more deposition, but a lot of this stuff might still be pretty firmly in place. Um, it's not likely to fall down slope anytime soon with the exception of this very small material talus. Um, it's tough to say, right? When you have so much sediment, you can't see how the rocks are attached. Yeah. Huh. So I, I suspect, you know, if the corals have a fine time growing there uh, and they are able to grow large, it's probably a fairly stable um, substrate on, you know, centuries to millennial time scales. These corals are not really heavy. Also, they're not going to add a lot of stress to the rock something that, that the rock's going to persist there unless it's moved by some sort of l large event like an earthquake or something. Yeah. Where are these corals though? Still 57 meters away. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gabby. <laughs> Dragon. <laughs> Vertically. <laughs> Just telling you what Steve told me. Yep. Oh, there's a coral friend. I should preface that by saying there's a disclaimer to about everything I say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, which is what's the disclaimer? Uh, that that it's it's for research purposes only and maybe subject <laughs> to change at any time, any moment, <laughs> for any reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's called the make stuff up disclaimer. <laughs> Go for Zoom. I want a disclaimer it, too. It's an oh. it's an informed, right hypothesis, but you know it's still just a hypothesis. If we make a estimate or a prediction about what's going to happen, go ahead. Just as equally, you know, when we're exploring, we could find something totally different. Right. We could run into a whale fall in 100 meters, and then you know our whole dive changes. That would be the best. We that should do that. That would be very cool. I need to get Rennie up here. He's the whale fall whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Although that that might that might be a one-off. You might only get one in your life. I think you do. I think that is extremely unlikely. I, I can't imagine, well, I can imagine, but how rare having a whale fall on a seamount is. It's like you know, that carcass has to sink in exactly the right yeah. way yeah. to land on the side of a slope on a seamount. Yeah. I wonder if it's as rare as driving an ROV around and finding a whale fall. <laughs> <laughs> I think there have been some experiments done. Um, I'm thinking in, in one case out in Canada, off Newfoundland, I think, where um, whale carcasses were repurposed for scientific experiments. You know, they'd washed up on shore, they towed them back out, sunk them so they could examine how they change over time. 
Oh, oh interesting. I remember seeing a press article about that, but it's there's one yeah. in, uh, a couple years just ago. off Vancouver Island, at Barkley, Barkley Canyon, similar. They have the whole fall there. Yeah. Ah, well, that's cool. There are whole ecosystems at them that don't exist in any other way at any other time or place. And they're so hard to find. That makes sense. I really want to follow up with the group we had out last end of last season. Um, we put out some experiments, some deployments of different types of bone um, on San Juan Seamount and one other site um, with the goal of they would pick them up um, and I, d I think they did pick them up earlier this year. Uh, chicken bone, like maybe beef bone, and pork bone, or something, oh, um, cool. and to see what the what the effect would be over uh, shorter time scales. Um, once these animals do kind of colonize these substrates, it, they typically reproduce rather quickly. Uh, kind of ensures their success, but First, they have to find that type of substrate. So you would imagine that their their larvae are somewhere in the water column, just waiting to find that site. This is stunningly steep, um, but kind of surprised at how little there is. Even on a boulder like this, I would expect to see some things, but not yeah. here. No critters is also data. It's just less fun data. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Go for zoom. Unfortunately, a lot of predictive habitat models for this kind of um, research, you know, if if we take into account it's a really nice tiny baby cucumber, little one. Okay, go wide. If we take into account all of the variables, you know, there there's this uh, process called predictive predictive habitat mapping um, that is being used pretty widely nowadays to kind of show probabilities of distributions of different kinds of coral and sponge species based on what we know about where they occur, the environmental data about where they occur. And um, it's been used with some great uh, effect off the U.S. West Coast and East Coast to identify Lophelia habitat, or it's a stony coral reef forming deep water coral. Um, and off the west coast, it's been used for gorgonians and things that are uh, potential fish habitat. And so uh, you could look uh, at a few a few of the variables you would want to look at if you were to do predict predictive habitat mapping for a seamount would first be have a good map and have good bathymetry. Once you have good bathymetry, um, you can determine a lot of other variables like slope and um, directionality of, of the face that you're working on. Um, what else? Get some data from backscatter to show you know, hardness of substrate. Um, that might be interesting. Oh, I want to like back a ledge. up just a little bit, Gabby. What's that? I want to back up just a little bit because I think you're Oh, I, yeah, you're absolutely right. I things am falling caught and on the brow. Thank you. I was trying to come up. I'm like, this isn't working. So you're kind of being, oh, yeah. you got in a little. Yep, in a spot little like there. hot yeah. spot. Pestled in. Yeah. Wow, look at this boulder though. Yeah, it's neat. 
So much coral. It's the most substantial coral outcrop we've seen all dive. Yeah. Oh, what a cool spot. Uh, yeah, so predictive habitat mapping. Um, bathymetry, uh, you can also incorporate uh, hydrographic models um, based on what you know about how currents flow on kind of a course resolution, so kilometers resolution rather than meters. It'd be great to have meter scale or, you know, hundreds of meter scale data that you could obtain from an ADCP. Um, where we can, you know, point it down, kind of look at the movement of the water through uh, the water column. Uh, but kind of the critical data for habitat mapping is having the species data. So doing a an analysis of a video transect, for example, and noting primarily presence but also absence uh, can be used. But a lot of predictive habitat models only look at presence um, and using presence as an indicator for the types of habitat that are favorable for certain species. You can put all that data through uh, some code and uh, develop some model outputs and test how good your model is at predicting um, the presence of these whatever species you're looking for. So could that have implications for deep sea mining? It very much could, yeah. Yeah, it's a... Uh, for for the seamount environment, um, I think the seamount environment is really complex. Uh, so you really couldn't do a good predictive habitat map based on one transect. You would need multiple per site to try and figure out if your activity is going to uh, impact, you know, one community or another. As you see, you know, even a southwest face versus a northeast face could have very different communities um, because, you know, maybe the currents are different on one side versus the other. The substrate characteristics are different. Um, that's kind of the first step, yeah. And I, I would expect, you know, if seafloor mining was to continue part of the due diligence of making sure you're not going through and destroying sensitive habitat would be to do the work um, to identify if your activity is going to have negative um, impacts on the environment. Impact assessments, yeah. It's done on land also quite a bit. It's also being done um, with respect to offshore wind installations. Uh, as you know, you yep. did it for the pelagics. Yep. Yeah, that was part of uh, what we had to do is just track how many, well, not me personally, because I was working the night shift and didn't see okay. any. Um, but the people during the day had to track how many whales, dolphins, turtles they saw. For uh, I think maybe they'll go into predictive habitat models, but just generally seeing how, how frequently uh, those animals pass by. Yeah, it's, it's not reasonable to be able to survey every square kilometer of, uh, or square meter of a seamount. But predictive habitat models are some of the strongest tools we have right now. There's a there's a very um, clever saying, and when you're trying to use predict predictive habitat models uh, to understand species distribution patterns, um, and that is, you know, models are what you put into them. So people often say all all models are wrong, but some models are useful. <laughs> so that kind of gives you an idea of you know where we're at and where we can go refining parameters so we can get them to be less wrong and more and more useful.
sonar says there's something to the left. Oh, I think I see it. It's an isolated boulder. I do know some people who are working on developing models using exploration data, but it's very, very difficult without kind of more standardized sampling. Um, so we, we probably would not be able to get effective models uh, out of these type of exploration surveys we're doing, even though we're looking at all the different faces of a seamount. Um, we want to probably focus on one seamount and do spokes on a wheel type of uh, surveys up every single side. Um, not just the ridges, but also the soft seafloor. Toad cameras are very useful for this kind of thing, ROVs also. But one of the things I'm most optimistic about are uh, autonomous uh, tools we can use to characterize the seabed so that we don't have to do this um, kind of survey where we can send down, you know, a fleet of autonomous vehicles that go and measure all the variables we're interested in and uh, take imagery if needed, report back, and then you can use an ROV to do more targeted operations sampling. But I, th I would say within five to ten years, almost every ship will have some sort of autonomous capability um, and deploy it alongside whatever their exploration tool of interest is. It's pretty cool. It's already happening. It's just, uh, yeah. Nautilus next year is going to have surface vehicle for mapping. Um, but yeah, and sub sub sea uh, vehicles are really interesting and really powerful. The lab I did my dissertation work in worked a lot with Sentry, uh, which is a very powerful vehicle for doing large-scale spatial, high-resolution spatial mapping and uh, characterization. You can use and put different sensors on a vehicle like that. And, uh, you know, for example, we were sniffing around for seep environments. And if you're in a cold seep environment, uh, you can put sensors on that look at oxidation reduction potential uh, over the course of a, you know, define your grid and how far um, the signal or sphere of influence from that seep extends. And then you can overlay you know, from the imagery that it takes what kinds of biological communities you find there. And you can get a really high resolution picture of know how dynamic these systems are fantastic terrain yeah are we about to blow by our sample depth uh yep i don't think this is very conducive to rocks though <laughs> yeah anyone see any loose rocks the left there, maybe. Wow. Is that a sponge stock in there? I think it is. Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen any of those in a bit.
starting to level off in Argus just a tiny bit. Kind of explains why we have so much talus material down below. It's probably all falling off of this big outcrop. Yeah, it's kind of a, a trippy view looking down on this. Some of my favorite environments are like this, but shallower. When you're up on top of the carbonate platform on a lot of these seamounts, you have fresh carbonates and blocks, they're just like failing left and right coming off the slope and on top of that you have like corals on the verticals and corals on the surface mm. cool. <laughs> yeah if anyone has a chance or if the opportunity to go to uh maybe the first cruise of next season we'll see some of that kind of stuff in the kingman and palmyra area where we have much shallower seamounts um, and shallower banks. All right, uh, let's, um, are we moving still? We're actually six meters from settling out, so this is a cool time to settle out and look for rocks. Yeah, we should take a rock. Yeah, we're going to have to keep going a little okay. further because we're pretty laid back now. That's fine. If we, if we don't get it, the next watch will. It's a little too, too steep to let Argus get too far ahead. Huskill. Gabby, if you're out of auto XY, I'm going to reset I you. I am out of, out of auto XY. Oh, there's a good bamboo over here. Oh, not a bamboo. Oh, Maybe yeah. a black coral? Maybe a black coral. Could be heteropathies. Go for zoom. Yeah. Uh, okay, go ahead. Heteropathies or trisopathies, something like that. You'll notice a lot of the sediment's gone as well. You know, you're not going to get a lot of sediment buildup here compared to deeper down the slope. I'm sure there's pretty appreciable currents that wrap around this. Speaking of, we didn't really do any current checks uh, on this watch. Any they sense? weren't really. Basically, every time I did a zoom, I was doing a current check, um, and there wasn't much appreciable current. Um, I yeah. think there might have been a slight southwest. Yep. Oh, what? Bathy Pathies. What is that? Are, is the one on the left Bathy Pathies too? Uh, yep, both of them. There was a, another Primnoid fan on the right also. This is some little bit dramatic here. I know we've collected, like the scientific community has collected these Bathy Pathies many, many, many times. Um, but I just don't know if we ever have gotten a good species name on those. 
I feel like they're so common enough that we should be able to know that by now. So the ship is at a stop and I'll just keep it that way. Your watch change. Okay, that's great. Yeah, yeah. there's still some exciting stuff happening Absolutely, here. Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, let me see, how far did we come up? At least like 50, 60 meters, just in that last little stretch. Yeah, um, so I, let's see, we're right here right now. Um, and I put a waypoint there, and we probably started about here or so, so. Let's see. These are the types of things I like the most about the seamount landscape is you can be going along on the slope, it's kind of dull, maybe not the most exciting, and then all of a sudden, boop, 50 meters vertical. Yeah, I'm awake. <laughs> <laughs> and you run into a monster truck course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. Is anyone about that. a climber here? I do a lot of climbing. Is 50 meters a large climb? Um, yeah, it's pretty big. Yeah. It's big. You use a 60 meter rope, right? 70 meters, yeah, so. The hesitation there pitches. told me that you're a very serious climber. <laughs> 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 I just pictured it in my head. <laughs> you're using a 70 meter rope, then that's yeah. two pitches, right? Yep. So we just went up two pitches of rock. It's a good analogy. Hey, hey. Eight minutes before the hour, every single time, exactly on the dot. 